So we just passed our 20 year mark in Dallas, Texas. As many years as I've been preaching an LGBT affirming minister, uh, message, we get a lot of non-LGBT people, in plain English, straight people, who really like our church. We have many online who follow us and have been part of our church online, some for many, many years. Some of the only financial support we receive are from non-LGBT people. Uh, and we don't have a lot of supporters, but out of those that we do, a large part of, of our support comes from non-LGBT people. And um, locally, however, We've had a lot of non-LGBT people come into the church. They love the church. They come for weeks. Some come for months. And then they suddenly realize the pastor's gay because we just never made an issue of it. You know, I don't hang a sign over the door that says, Welcome to a church pastored by a queen. You know, I don't say that. So... Uh, we just live our lives and do what we're doing. You know, that's how we, we always handled our church. And I'm not saying that was the right way or the best way, but that's just the way we did it. And so all of a sudden they realized the pastor's gay and they realized our position on LGBT Christians, that this church is welcoming and inclusive of all people. I don't care whether you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. If you want to know God and you want to serve God, this Christian community is open to you and available to you. And you are able to not only come and be in the pew, but you are able to fully participate as a member of this church without any prejudice, without any... Um, you know, that we don't have first-class uh, citizens and second-class citizens in this church. And uh, there are many churches out there that say, you know, oh yeah, we welcome, you know, gay people, lesbian people, bisexual, transgender people. We welcome them. But when you get there, all you're welcome to do is come, put your money in the offering plate, and listen to the preaching. You're not going to be able to participate in the ministry. You're not going to. They don't want you singing in their choir. They don't want you playing instruments. They don't want you teaching Sunday school. They don't want you doing any of these things. Uh, you know, uh, they have a, a second-class citizenship in their church. We don't have that in this church. When we say we are LGBT affirming, that means that uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people are fully included in this ministry. We remain, however, very much an evangelical church. Now, I hate, in the era of Trump, I hate using that word because I know for many people it has a very negative connotation. However, we are in reality an evangelical church. What does that mean? Evangelical simply means that you believe that the preaching of the gospel is done in order to, to win souls to Christ, to bring people into the kingdom of God. Evangelizing is what you're doing. An evangelical church believes that the primary work of the church is to evangelize, okay? We are an evangelical church. We believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we preach Him as the way, the truth, and the life. And we are also, unlike other churches that accept uh, LGBT people, <clears throat> we are also not even remotely afraid of the Bible, because if you study the Bible, which I have to confess, for many years when I was in mainstream ministry, I'm going to be honest with you folks, I never took the time to investigate Sodom and Gomorrah. I never took the time to investigate 
passages in the Bible that are commonly used to condemn wholesale gay lesbian people. I never took the time. I, I just kind of went along with the flow and what everybody else preached against gay lesbian I preached it with them, you know? And that's what most preachers do. They never take the time to investigate these matters carefully and usually the only thing that will motivate somebody to really look into it is when somebody close to them comes out. You know, um, I knew a, a young man who visited our church some years ago. His father was a Pentecostal preacher. And he came out to his mom and dad and they told him they didn't want anything to do with him. He was no longer welcome in their home, blah, blah, blah. And uh, a couple months later, he said, his dad called him and said, Son, Mom and I want to apologize to you. We are so sorry. Uh, I have been spending some time deeply investigating uh, the Word of God concerning uh, homosexuality and what have you. And to be honest, son, I am shocked at what I've come to understand. Uh, what has traditionally been the position is not at all in keeping with what the Word of God truly says if you take the time to look at it. So he said, we are so sorry. You're certainly welcome in our home. You're, you're our son. We love you. But you see, it took somebody close to him coming out to motivate him to investigate the issue more carefully. And um, for many of us in the LGBT community, it took us being honest with ourselves and finally saying, I can't live a lie. I can't live, you know, I can't try to be something I'm not. And I did this in 1989. And when I finally, quote, came out and decided I was going to be honest with myself and honest with God and honest with the world and honest with my family. Um, I was convinced that I was going to hell in a handbasket, that God didn't want anything to do with me, and that I had no business even trying to be in church. So I left the church behind, and I lived my life, and I did things I'm ashamed of, and, and you know, lived terribly for a few years and finally the Lord was able to break through my thick skull and convince me that I needed to look a little more carefully into some things and so I did and I refused for those of you who might be watching and you're going to say to yourself oh he read a bunch of books written by queer theologians who are just trying to find a way to justify this you know no I didn't a matter of fact I purposely did not I grew up in a fundamentalist evangelical church and one thing that church did for me is they helped me to believe that the Word of God is my authority, period. I don't need anything outside of God's Word. So I literally refused to read any book, anything written by anybody, straight or gay, that dealt with uh, Christianity as it relates to homosexuality and what have you. Instead, I went straight to the Word of God. But I began to research it and read it much more carefully. I began to look into the etymology. I went back to the Greek. I went back to the Hebrew. I looked at the origin. Etymology means the origin of words. You know, um, a lot of times people don't think about etymology when you're uh, reading something. But it's very important sometimes to understand uh, where a word comes from or how a word was created. You know, for instance, if I say today, Reaganomics. Now many of you who are young, you don't even know what Reaganomics means. That's a word that means nothing to you. To those of us who are a little bit older and sat under Ronald Reagan as president, we understand that that's a term that came into being uh, back in the 80s that meant 
uh, trickled down, that wealth trickled down from the top. That the more money the wealthy make, eventually, you know, they're going to hire more people in their companies and they're going to give more pay and they're going to uh, uh, give more benefits. Well, of course, those of us with brains today recognize that even though I believe with all my heart uh, President Reagan was sincere in his, I really do believe the man was sincere in believing this, but I also think he was naive because the truth is that the more wealth people at the top get, the more wealth they want. And they'll continue to rob people of their pay. They'll continue to rob people of their benefits. They'll continue to reduce the number of positions in their companies so that they can show more profit, you know. And anyway, but Reaganomics means basically trickle-down economics. But if I use that word and you don't have any concept of the etymology, or the origin of that word, how that word came into being and how it uh, came into usage, then you, you don't understand what that word means. You have no clue. And I've got news for you. There are words in the Bible, uh, especially in the New Testament, uh, there's one word that the Apostle Paul, for instance, uh, literally coined. It is a term that is not found in Greek literature anywhere. Uh, before the Apostle Paul utilized it. And it is a term that many uh, translators have translated homosexual. And yet the term literally comes from the marriage of two words. Those words being lift or elevate and the second word being a couch or a bed. Elevate couch or lift couch or elevate bed. And when you look at the etymology, you understand that what Paul was saying was, in a nutshell, people who sleep with somebody in an effort to get something from them. Not prostitution where you sleep with them for pay. That's, that's slightly different. But this is uh, somebody sleeping with somebody in order to attain you know, there are people who will sleep with somebody, they'll, you know, uh, get involved in a relationship with somebody they're not, they're not interested in, they're not attracted to, simply so they can have a roof over their head. Uh, there are people, there's an old term that is used in Hollywood, and that is the casting couch. And really, casting couch is probably the best illustration for what Paul was saying. What is a casting couch? That means uh, that directors and people in power in Hollywood uh, sleep with starlets and actors and actresses in order for them to earn a role in their movie or in their production. So the person sleeps with someone who has power in order to attain a job, you know, to attain a role. That's what Paul was talking about. That is not homosexuality. That's not even close. <laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with homosexuality. But Paul was talking about people using sex as the means of attaining something. And then when you understand that in Paul's time, going back into the ancient world, uh, there were actually innumerable pagan religions that used sex as part of their religious ritual. See, now, we're not familiar with that because in the modern world, we don't have a lot of religions that do this, okay? But in the ancient world, it was common. This was done every day. And so what would happen is, if you wanted your flocks blessed, if you wanted your sheep to multiply, if you wanted your prosperity or your wealth to grow, if you wanted your wife to have many children, you know, whatever you wanted from your deity, you literally would have to engage in a, in a sexual ritual with a priest or a representative from that religion. That's how they would go about it. And so you slept with a person of power, the priest, 
well, the priest's representative, in order to attain blessing. That's what Paul was talking about. Now, that's too much for most people. Most Christians, they want to go through the world. Oh, no, King James says this word. You know, uh, Amplified Bible uses this word. The NIV uses this word. Bless God, I'm just going to go with that. Well, that's all well and good. But if this issue doesn't affect you, then you're not going to bother taking the time to look any further and look any deeper. Well, I got news for you, honey. Don't come at me thinking you're going to argue and debate with me about gay people in the church. Don't waste your breath on it because I've spent the time studying. I've spent the time researching. I started with a negative prejudice on this issue. I literally started absolutely believing that gay lesbian people had no business in the church. Even though it affected me and I felt condemned and I felt like I was headed to hell in a handbasket. I absolutely believed this. But I spent the time to do my research. So when people on Twitter and to people on Facebook and people in email think they're going to argue and debate with me, sweetheart, you ain't going to get five minutes of my time. I'm not going to waste any of my time on you. If you want to be stupid and ignorant, if you want to walk around thinking you know something you don't know anything about, have a party, but you're not going to waste my time with it because this is a battle I fought and won and I ain't going to keep fighting it. I don't owe you nothing. I don't owe you an explanation. My walk is with God. I answer to God. And that's as far as I'm going to go with it. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. Say Lord.